Warning, this video contains minor swearing and geology slash astronomy based nerd shit. Hello class, today we'll be going Today we'll be doing something a bit different. Instead of giving you a packet that says nothing but the mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell, I'll be going over a history lesson. Ooh, that's late. Did I freaking stutter? Anyways, I'll be going over 4.2 billion years of a neighboring star system's history just beyond Alpha Centauri named the Olympus system. Though we'll mostly be looking over 560 million years ago when complex life first evolved to the present day. But before we go over the life of the Olympus system, we must go over the we must go over the planets of the system. There are three habitable planets in the Olympus system, and we must go over their geology and their planetary neighbors. Do we have to? Geology is way. <coughs> the old shits are just asking me to shoot you. Anyway, let us begin. First, let's go over the star of the Olympus system. The star Olympus. Olympus is a G-type star, much like our own sun. When complex life first evolved 560 million years ago, Olympus was much like our own sun around this time, both in light levels, age, heat, etc. Along with this, Olympus has the same light spectrum as our sun too. First is Hades, which is the Olympus equivalent of Mercury and is extremely hot. Next is Aries, which is their version of Venus. And now let's go over the first planet with life, Athete. Why are all the planets so far just the planets of our solar system, but with Greek name? Any more questions? Good. Now for Athena, it's fairly Earth-like, but with some differences. One. Much like all the planets in this system, Athena has a high, high amount of geological activity, which causes higher amounts of annual earthquakes, volcanoes, underwater volcanoes, etc. Tectonic, the tectonic movement has been tracked down to a single supercontinent called Greece, which splits into three other continents named Rome, Athens, and Sparta. After this, Rome and Sparta rejoin into when can we get into the alien life of, on a deep yeah. I will end you all! Anyway, Rome and Sparta rejoin to a new continent and, and Athena splits into to Atras and Atlantis. As for orbital characteristics, Athena orbits 0 0.97 AU, which means its year is about 300 to 280 days long. It also means that the average temperature of Athena is, is at 20 degrees Celsius. Athena's days are about 20 hours long, maybe a little more. As for its orbital angle is at 25 degrees, which gives us slightly hotter summers and slightly colder winters. There are two moons orbiting Athena, which are Olympia, the biggest and closest moon, and an asteroid named Certainty. Due to the closeness of Olivia, Athena has ties that are about 1.7 times bigger than the ones on Earth. And last but not least, let's talk about the atmosphere. No one's gonna say that's lame. Okay, okay. Well, anyway, Athena's atmosphere is similar to Earth with 65% nitrogen, 1% other gases, 1% argon, 3% carbon, and 30% oxygen. Our next planet with life is Poseidon, which is the Olympus equivalent of Mars. But unlike Mars, Poseidon is actually habitable. Poseidon has two-thirds two the size and gravity of Earth, and has a water-to-land percentage of 87% land. Wait, no. <sighs> Poseidon has two-thirds the size and gravity of Earth. 
and has a water to land ratio of 87% water and 13% land. Poseidon orbits at 1.16 AU away from the sun, which is somewhere around the edge of the habitable zone. And due to how close Athena is to Poseidon, and from it being a third smaller, this causes Poseidon to be tightly locked over millions of years. This means that one side of the planet is constantly facing the sun, and the other side is in complete darkness. The atmospheric, comp the atmospheric composition is similar to Athena, but with slightly less oxygen and having an atmospheric density of 1.3. Due to the atmospheric density, this prevents one the dark side of the planet from completely freezing over, and then later freezing over the rest of the planet. And finally, tectonic movement. There has been a single supercontinent named Atlantis, which then splits into a continent named Triton, and Amphimachus, then splits into three islands. One island later has two-thirds of its surface sunk from mel melting ice, and one other island finally rejoins with Triton. Our next two planets are just Jupiter and Saturn, named Zeus and Eros respectively. And there are an asteroid belts that are in between Zeus and Poseidon, and another one between Eros and outer space, named Hydra and Titan respectively. For both of the planets beyond Titan, they are- Oh, I get it! Titans in Greek mythology are many giant-sized creatures that cause destruction. Now I see why the- HAVE YOU LEARNED NOTHING?! Uh, anyway. There is one habitable planet around here. A moon of Zeus that has liquid water on it. And a surprising amount of life here. Now, this moon named Artemis shouldn't even have water because it's so far away from the sun. And you'd be right. Any water around here should be frozen solid. But, there is liquid water here because of a little something called tidal flexing. Oh, come on, Ar Artemis. Stop flexing like that. Tidal flexing is caused by the chungus gravity of Zeus, which makes the ice flex, making heat. This, combined with geological activity, makes the heat necessary to, to have at least liquid water under the surface. Now, for planetary slash orbital characteristics of Artemis, Artemis has an atmosphere mostly made of 70% nitrogen, 3% carbon dioxide, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, 2% other gases, and 3% hydrogen sulfide. On top of this, Artemis is tightly locked with, with Zeus because of its immense gravity. Though, since Zeus doesn't produce light, this manipulates Artemis in a different way. It causes all the ocean levels to rise as you get closer to where Zeus has the strongest gravitational effect and away from that effect because of a little something called centrifugal forces. Zeus's gravity has, has a strong effect not only above ground, but this affects the mantle below, below the surface. Quick lesson on the mantle. The mantle is a layer below below the surface of the planet where, where it's completely made of magma. When, when this magma moves from convection currents where, where warm stuff rises and cool stuff lowers creating a loop, this causes tectonics to move above. above. Anyways, back, back, back to this. When the mantle is pulled towards Zeus, this causes there to be so much geological activity around this area that that Artemis has the strongest earthquakes and most amount of annual volcanic eruptions out of anywhere in the solar system. In fact, it's believed that that a huge chain reaction of vol volcanic eruptions actually caused the formation of the continental ar archipelagos we see today, and the first mass extinction. And there is a few more problems with Artemis. One, its gravity is actually 30% larger. Two, for at least a 
third of Artemis's orbit, the moon is drenched in complete darkness because it's now behind Zeus, facing away from the sun, and there's no other light coming towards it. And when it is in light, one side is constantly in darkness because it's facing Zeus and gets no light. It's likely that all it's likely that all energy here will be gathered through the hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere or through hydrothermal vents. And since Artemis's parent parent planet, Zeus, is 3.4 AU away from Olympus, this gives us about 4 K lumens per square meter per square foot of light for the locals to work with. This is about 2k lumens above the minimum for photosynthesis. So this means that photosynthetic life might not be as efficient as they are on Earth, which is... <clears throat> well that does it for today class, or what's left of you. Tomorrow we'll see the emergence of life on Athena, and don't forget to do your homework over what happened in class today. Don't tell the police what happened here, okay? Good. I'll see you guys later.